I held a lot of resentment toward my mom for many years because I could not understand how she didn't know. I could not understand how you didn't know that this man was sneaking out of your bed and into mine. I, I still to this day struggle with that a little bit, just the thought. The initial abuse, I've actually gone through a couple of different, um, I guess, forms of abuse ultimately being the same. Sexual abuse being the basis of it uh, started when I was about five years old. Uh, there was a cousin, a female cousin of mine that used to come and visit often. And um, from what I can remember, it just started off as little small events leading up to much larger events. You know, she would have me to touch her or she would try to touch me, you know, in places that people shouldn't be touching other kids, you know. She was a couple years older than me. And um, I was also, um, admittedly a little bit afraid of her because of where she was from you know she was from the projects and so those the project people were known to be tougher you know and so for me it was just a matter of you know fear and not wanting to upset her so um I did everything that she said and I remember specifically um the culmination of it all and behind my mom's garage at her home that we grew up in and I remember there being a fruit tree back there and we were back there picking the fruit off the tree and she um, decided to, to make me touch her and she, of course, me and she um, ultimately wanted me to lick her and um, so I had to do that and I did that and that was one of the worst memories I have. It was a memory that I, um, I tucked away for a very long time. The other abuse um, started around age seven, and um, my mom had split up from who I thought to be my father at the time, but that's a whole other story. And she had a living boyfriend at the time who was a firefighter. And um, I guess he decided that he um, wanted to sneak into my room, and so that's what started to happen. He would sneak into my room in the middle of the night, and initially, I thought I was a dream. I just, I really didn't believe that it was actually happening, because it would be two, three o'clock in the morning, I'm assuming, you know, and he would come in, and he would try to force himself into me, and thankfully, that never actually happened, but he would definitely try, and, and that was painful enough. Um, mentally and physically, of course. And it happened often, you know, and, and my mom never knew what was going on. And um, she would leave me with him a lot, you know, if she went to work or took care of other business, she would leave me there with him. Um, and I had a younger sister. My sister is four years younger than me. So I never wanted him to touch her. That was really my ultimate goal, so I stayed always. I, I know that I easily could have left. I could have gone to my grandmother's house and stayed. You know, I had teachers at school that really cared about me that I could have gone to, but I chose to stay and endure what I was enduring because I figured if I left that he would then turn on her. So I stayed and there were many occasions that he um, tried to force himself onto me, um, make me watch pornographic videos and try to make me do the things that were in the videos and all sorts of weird things that a seven-year-old shouldn't be <laughs> privy to. So um, it, that went on for four years. I was 11 years old when it finally came to an end. Um, my mom and grandmother, I remember, had gone out shopping and they left me with him. I don't even remember where my sister was at the time, but um, when they came home, I was crying because I had just had enough. When they came home, they were wondering why I was crying and my grandmother must have just known something wasn't right because she, her first question to me was, did he touch you? And I said, yeah, 
and I told them that it had been going on for years. And so, um, of course, my mother put him out right at that moment. Um, and we ended up going through court and things like that for prosecution purposes. Um, he ended up with, I believe, 18 months in prison. Um, but that was it. And so for me, it left me with a lot of anger, a lot of pain, because uh, my family was one of those sweep it under the rug kind of family. So we never again spoke of it ever. You know, we spoke of it in court. I had to detail and, and you know, describe the things that he had done to me, but it never was spoken of outside of that. I never received counseling or anything. Um, it was just one of those things where you're tough enough to deal with it and we'll just move forward from there. And so that's kind of how it was. And, and that's what I did, not realizing the, the overall effect that it actually had and how it would affect the rest of my life you don't think about those things and how it affects you into adulthood and how it affects the decisions that you make and <laughs> you know the, the the things that you ultimately attract into your life because this is your way of thinking or you know what you think to be normal you don't realize the effects that it has so and apparently your elders don't think that way either so um so I dealt with it the best way that I knew how and that was just it. I held a lot of resentment toward my mom for many years because I could not understand how she didn't know. I could not understand how you didn't know that this man was sneaking out of your bed and into mine. My brain couldn't wrap around that. I still to this day struggle with that a little bit, just the thought. I have thank God forgiven her and moved forward moved on past that I don't hold any resentment anymore but I you know you do still wonder how, how does that happen you know um how do you leave your child with this person I don't know what her method of thinking was whatever it was you know she's my mom and I know that she didn't set out to hurt me you know I don't really know what her her thought process were to this to this day one of the things that I realized about um, childhood abuse especially is that because your brain is first of all not fully developed, it becomes a part of who you are. Um, it becomes a, it, it molds itself into your, your development, your emotional development, especially if it's not handled um, appropriately or effectively in a healthy manner. If you don't deal with it during that time that the person is going through it or, you know, just recently after having gone through it so that you can deal with it effectively, um, it, it starts to shape who you become and it gets intertwined, unfortunately, with your personality in some way. For me, because it was never dealt with, um, neither of the abuse situations was were ever dealt with and um th my my mom never knew about the first one however until recently um it, it it molded a lot of my decisions and a lot of my behaviors as i started to get older when i became a teenager i became very promiscuous um and i've often heard that people go one avenue or the other they completely shut down or they become really promiscuous i obviously chose the promiscuous route and for me it was a matter of trust though um i have i had subsequently dealt with a couple of other issues involving um rape and date rape and things like that as I got older. So those things to me just kind of compounded. It was just kind of, and I dealt with them alone again because it was just kind of, okay, well, I've already dealt with this before. So this just goes into the pot and it's just cool, you know, and I'll just deal with it. But it became for me, um, it, it brought me to the point where I didn't trust people. I didn't like people. I didn't trust anyone, male, female. I became very bitter, very cold, very angry at the world. Um, it was it was a really awful situation. And it was more awful for me, I think, internally than the people that dealt with me. Any type of child abuse is, is an awful experience, but I think when you're violated sexually, 
it it tears another part of you, a different part, a, a deeper part um, of you away than maybe like a physical abuse or something like that. There's just an added um, piece that's missing. And so for me, sex just became more of a game. Like um, it was just used to, so that for one, I realized that I had a fear of saying no to people because I felt like if I said no, they were just going to take it anyway. I have felt like my entire life that I have had two people in me fighting all all of these years. You know, there's like a good side and a bad side and I've always felt that. And um, my only assumption is that it had to come from experience in these things as a, ch as a child because I believe ultimately that I'm a good person. But I think that because I've been through so much so many traumas that it put something else in me and those people were always fighting and it's always you know that that person that I call the bad person you know is the person who thinks that this type of behavior is okay you know that accepts this type of behavior if it comes because well whatever I've accepted it before it just is what it is you know you know but then I have this other person that knows better but isn't always strong enough I guess to, to overpower the other thoughts. It's a constant battle between good and bad. And even though I'm healed today, I still, you know, deal with it. Those people fighting each other. I was 16 when I had my first daughter. We kind of grew up together and I was very overprotective of her and subsequently the rest of my children. Even still to this day, I'm very overprotective of my son even. Um, and my girls, my the one my daughter's now grown and I'm still very overprotective of her, you know, so, but I kept them very close to me. It was very hard for me to do daycare and things like that because I had always believed that my mom didn't react appropriately. A part of me always, always said that if anything ever happened to my to my kids, it was over. Uh, because I know that I wouldn't be able to handle it because I'd already been there and I know the damage that it does. I went through a second marriage um, in 2004. That marriage was very emotionless. I didn't even like him. <laughs> so I, I went into that marriage with the same belief system. Um, by the time that marriage was over, I had just done some growing and I realized that I had some issues that I needed to deal with. And I remembered, yes, that I had written this book and that helped me relive a lot of the experiences. And, and so I kind of turned my attention to self-development and so I started reading a lot of self-help books and you know ways to try to change my way of thinking about people I literally had been unhappy my whole life I don't really remember any states of happy at all <laughs> and that's crazy to be in your 30s and never have been happy that to me was huge and it was a realization that hit me very hard and I had to figure out how to be happy. I had to figure that out. Nobody could give that to me. Nothing that I tried in my entire life was able to provide me with happy. Um, I, I tried the marriage. I tried, you know, I had the kids and I loved them. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, I couldn't get that from them. You know, it was just, it was, nothing was giving that to me. And so I had to realize that it was something inside of me that I had to change, obviously, in order for me to, to obtain what it was I was looking for. So I just set out on a mission to find happy. <laughs> like that was just my mission. Like I have to be able to smile and mean it. Like that's what I wanted. I wanted to be able to smile and actually feel what my face was showing. <laughs> and so that's, that's where my life was at that point. I was actually on my way to a church one Sunday morning. 
somehow I ended up at a different church. And um, when I walked through the doors of that church, I literally felt weight lifted off me. Like I felt a hundred pounds lighter and it was very weird. I wasn't expecting it at all. I wasn't even ready for it completely, I don't think. Um, but upon entering the service and the, what started out with the choir, I don't think I stopped crying the whole time from the time I walked in <laughs> until the time that I got in my car. And um, that happened subsequently each Sunday thereafter. And it seemed as though the pastor who was speaking was speaking directly to me and some issue that I was trying to deal with. And I was stuck there. I needed this. This was what I had been looking for. So it was, it was this God that my grandmother introduced me to when I was younger that kept me in church all the time that I had kind of turned my back on over the years. And that's what gave me the happy that you see before you today. <laughs> you know, um, it took that, um, that spiritual aspect to, to help, to heal me. I had realized that I hadn't gone through any healing processes. Yes, I had done a lot of self-development and I had matured in thought processes and things like that, but I hadn't actually healed or dealt with any of the things of my past. Again, I had never even thought again about the abuse that my cousin put me through. I had to deal with that. Um, the pastor one Sunday spoke about forgiveness. And I think this is what started me on my path to healing and forgiving and things. Um, he said, not forgiving is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. And that hit me like a ton of bricks because that's how I've been living my whole life. I have had this resentment toward all of these people in my life. And I had had resentment toward people that never even did anything to me. I just didn't like people, period. And so I had to realize in that moment that the problem was me. It wasn't the whole world wasn't crazy. <laughs> it was me that was the problem. And so I am the one that needed to do the healing. I am the one that needed to fix me so that I can find this happy that I'm looking for. So that's what started the process. And I started right there in that moment. And I just started to let go of things and just pray and just, you know, just, just ask for help with letting go and just, you know, coming to terms with the things that happened to me and why they happened to me. And, and ultimately there had to be a, a, a larger goal, a bigger picture, you know, and at that point I didn't realize that it was to maybe help someone one day that was going through these situations. You know, up until that point, it was me, 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 me. Why did this happen to me? Why am I going through this? You know, and not realizing that it's not really about me. And it's not. And that's about January is when that realization hit me. And it was like, you know what? Yeah, you went through these things, but you're still here. Obviously you were strong enough to endure what you endured because you're standing here today. So there is some elements of you that is a very strong person and somebody else needs that. Somebody needs you to tell them that they are beautiful and that they mean enough that it's not their fault that this happened to them. Somebody out there in the world needs to hear that from you. And so you need to take you out of it and, and focus on helping someone else because that's ultimately what it's about. And so that brought me joy. That brought me a joy that I had never, ever had before. And so that's kind of where my healing came from. It came from taking me out of the picture. <laughs>